live everywhere. Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Friday, September 16th, 2016. There's two 16s in there. Can we handle that? I think so. I hope so. Uh, let's see. Lots in the news today. Uh, wow. I don't even know where to start. As usual, uh, Donald Trump's not a birther anymore. <laughs> uh, that's the... That's the word out of the campaign, and that's what was burning up Twitter last night and still again this morning. I believe he, well, the campaign issued a statement. I don't, I'll hold on for just a minute, because I think everybody knows where we are. But the campaign issued a statement and said, oh yeah, uh, back in 2011, he uh, sent a team of investigators out there looking for the birth certificate, and he found it, and it's all good. (laughs) Of course, he's been attacking... Uh, President Obama's birth since then anyway and he's said a million times don't listen to what the (laughs) campaign says, listen to what I say no one's authorized to speak for me and uh, I don't know, it's all a big joke Uh, we'll discuss it, I'll read what's being written about it, but there's nothing to figure out here, Donald Trump is a piece of crap and his campaign is a piece of crap it might be best explained by just learning more about the alt-right, which is sad that we would have to do that. And well, I guess we got some documentation we can delve into just to give people a background in it. But basically, a good portion of what the alt-right does is just like dealing with 4chan. It's the same guys, essentially, or Gamergate. The same characters recur. The same people, uh, in many cases, are behind it. Literally the same people behind these things. We'll talk about a little bit about that, I guess. Well, might as well dedicate the show to that. And uh, they do their, they do what they do for, for the lulls, as they say. The, a perversion of the LOLs, which is a perversion of the English language in the first place. Anyway, a laugh out loud, LOL. Just the one you suspected when I said that. Uh, and lulls are just sort of alt-right, gamergate, 4chan, online troll guy shorthand for LOLs that they get by laughing at normies. That is to say, the, their slang for people who aren't them uh, or who are otherwise normal. They, they actually, this is the way they have fun. They deride normal people. But of course, uh, hey, we're... I guess we're used to that. I mean, what is normal anyway? We're always questioning the same thing. So couldn't there be room for doing this? Sure. Except, uh, you know, we question whether normality is really all that normal as a part of an overall effort to open up uh, civic life in general to anyone who wants to participate civilly, whereas they are doing it. Uh, for quite the opposite reason, in order to make it possible for them to operate uncivilly and, uh, you know, basically uh, do what they want to do and not be called out for it. That's essentially it. And uh, the lulls thing, this is where, I mean, there's a big overlap with the Pepe the Frog thing. There's a big overlap. This is the why. Very often they will send uh, all sorts of insanely anti-Semitic comments, photos, memes, what have you, all over the place, or to anybody they suspect is Jewish, or anybody who they suspect might be offended by seeing such material. They do it, and then people say, look, see, they're anti-Semitic, and then they all, like, secretly, half-secretly, type to one another, lols. Uh, they believed it. And, you know, it, I guess part of the idea is you're not supposed to be able to tell which ones of them are true believers in Nazism or anti-Semitism, if any, or those who are simply doing it to get a rise out of people or simply doing it to confound people while they confound them politically as well. You know, if they spend time screaming about how anti-Semitic we are, we'll just be going ahead and doing what we want to do in the meantime. Uh, basically a variant on the old uh, reality-based community thing. Uh, here we are studying the statement of the campaign judiciously. Look, I can prove that he's been making statements about Obama's birth since after 2011. I know. 
And it's good, and you should, and it's useful to some people who haven't yet come around to the realization that these guys are operating outside of the rules entirely. And uh, they don't care, essentially. So, I mean, they may very well have said, you know what, let's issue a retraction from the campaign. If it works, great. I mean, if the if the political press is dumb enough to say, yeah, sure, this is it. Now we can't hang this on him anymore because a statement has been issued. And if it doesn't work, so what? Lulls on the people who worried that it might work. Har har. That's, that's what's going on behind the scenes. That's actually what's happening. That's, uh, um, only one of very many things that are occupying my attention early this morning. I guess just to switch gears entirely. Um, well, let's see. First switch of gears will be, as uh, as it always ought to be, noting that Bill in Portland, Maine, has started off with his morning tweet. This will help us set the stage for today. Daily Coast Radio, as you have probably guessed by now, is live. KGRX, that's me, David Waldman. Occasionally, I forget to remind you that I'm hosting the show. The uh, the announcer man up at the uh, front and the back of the show, he, he does that. Greg Dworkin very frequently will remind you that I am David Waldman as well. He's not going to be here today. However, that brings me to uh, a different agenda item. Josie Duffy Rice, our crusading justice beat writer at Daily Coast, who has an impressive background in the criminal justice system and the I go, well, I don't know, do you have any civil justice, civil justice background? She's a lawyer, is what I'm saying here. And, uh, and a good one at that, and well trained, and a great writer, and covering all sort, well, it started out sort of as like as a prosecutorial misconduct slash general justice slash social justice slash whatever the hell is interesting to lawyers and people with an eye on the legal system beat. Josie Duffy Rice, who will be with us today. I figured uh, we've been working on this one for a while, and she is extremely busy because there's a lot of injustice in the world, and she has to write about it. I get to skip writing about most of the injustice, and I can just focus on some of the dumbest things, and I don't have to write it down. I get to talk. That's that's the advantage. Anyway, point is we've been working on trying to get her on for a while. Uh, we just thought it would be a good idea, and she's got... She, she's got a beat that really fits, I think, with our, our normal accidental, really, Friday agenda of bringing up a story or two that is important, that will make you sound smart if you talk about it with your friends over the weekend, and that you might possibly have missed, even though you are, by all accounts, an extraordinarily well-informed and smart person and critical thinker and uh, avid, uh, voracious reader, one might even say. I don't know. If you want to pile it on, right? You want to gild the lily? Sure. You're all those things. Otherwise, you'd be listening to pop music on the radio instead of this insane rambling. Anyway, the point is Josie will be here, and it seems like a good fit for a Friday. And we're going to see whether, you know, we'll see how, the, how this goes for uh, whether this is a major imposition <laughs> on her time or whether she feels comfortable like Joan and wants to come back repeatedly or, uh, or, or you know, maybe it feels as comfortable as Greg. Who knows? I don't want to. I don't want to jinx anything. I just want to say it's going to go well, and we've always got great material to cover there. And at any given day, any any of the writers, this is nuts. I don't know why I don't have more of them on here, except that I wouldn't have time to, to waste your time with rants like this, I guess. But any one of our writers could stop in at any time and read their latest story. And, you, I mean, it would be like the same that we'd be dipping your – your spoon into the river here. I mean, so much goes by. Uh, it's hard for me. I don't know why I should curate this thing. So occasionally it makes sense to inject another voice. Josie's will be the one today. I think this, I think this is going to be good. Uh, look for her in the 10 o'clock hour, which for you podcast listeners means, uh, down the other end, I guess. And, uh, she's got, she's got some business to take care of today because she's busy, you see. And, uh, 10 o'clock, 10.30, maybe even have to push it to then and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll join in and, uh, take a peek in on 
what she's been covering for Daily Coast, and uh, who knows, maybe even a sneak peek of what she hasn't covered yet so that you get the newspaper early. Okay. Uh, other thing that's got me wound up this morning. Uh, I got this news. I got the tip that I just I, I missed yesterday, and I just barely managed to pick it up today. Uh, Scott Charles with this one. Uh, he showed to me, although the, the link he had for it didn't work, so I had to look it up. I got another link. It works. I just want to welcome you all to the Texas Campus Carry Program. Those of you who are longtime listeners of the show or longtime readers of Gun Fail or just follow on Twitter and found out about this this way, Texas has a whorehouse in it. Uh, that's, that's an old musical, but that's not what I'm talking about. Texas has a lot of guns in it, though. We know that. And... We have a new-ish law on the books in Texas and all over the place. We got Texas isn't even the only state in the gun news this week and this morning. Texas implemented what they called campus carry. Uh, they, of course, also o- adopted open carry laws for the state. And along the way, in the same package, basically, came campus carry. The theory being, oh my God, ISIS could come to Texas A&M, let's say. And have a mass, well, they might hold a mass shooting. They plan it, you gotta talk to the activities board, it's all kinds of bureaucracy. You have a mass shooting, and, uh, all these Texans with all their guns, what a waste it would be if they weren't able to gun down these ISIS attackers by themselves, and thereby save the government money. I guess, is probably the, the complete thinking here. And so, we'll have campus carry. You gotta be able to protect yourself on campus. Well, but the chances of an ISIS attack, well then, Mr. Liberal, what about campus sexual assault, huh? What about all the women who are raped on campus that you're always complaining about? Which really, they had it coming anyway. Uh, Yeah, okay, don't start on that. What do you want? You telling me women should be armed at all times so that they can shoot their their attackers? Uh, Well, you know, what do you say to that, right? No, they shouldn't. They should hit them with a ladder or a baseball bat. Or invite them to swim at a pool with no lifeguard. Something like that. Uh, well, okay, it's hard to argue against it. But then again, it's it's hard to argue for it as well. Athena, by the way, knows the uh, best little whorehouse in Texas, the musical. I may also know the best whorehouse in Texas, but I'm, I'm referring to the musical. And it's given me the uh, second line there. Yes, Lord have mercy on our souls. If you're not ancient enough to remember... That crazy ass musical, and uh, and the mus the me movie version of it, which was just that much more entertaining. Dolly Parton, Burt Reynolds, Dom DeLuise. In other words, it was made in the eighteen nineties. Anyway, so they have campus carry there, and I just uh, we might as well get to the goddamn point already. It is two weeks. It's the the law was effective August first, but of course nobody's back at school August first. Classes begin August twenty ninth. At least they did. At, uh, where the hell are we talking about? Uh, to Tarleton, Tarleton State University, which I believe is, I think I saw in passing, is part of the Texas A&M network, which I don't even know how that works out there, but it doesn't matter. It's a state university in Texas, and that means campus carry is the order of the day. August 29th was the first day of classes we have had. If you haven't guessed already with this huge, long lead-up, our first accidental discharge on campus in a residence hall. Very calmly broken is the news here in JTAC News, as the best I could get, the official student newspaper of Tarleton. Since 1919, when that whorehouse opened in Texas, firearm accidentally discharged in residence hall. Thanks to Rachel Crawford, the managing editor on this one. Uh, and it happened on Wednesday, September 14th. So actually less than... Uh, well, I, I guess it's, they're two weeks into classes, but I, I guess the, the 13th day of classes, basically. So I think that's where I come to the two weeks thing. Anyway, Wednesday, September 14th, a firearm was accidentally discharged in, you'll love this one, Integrity Hall. That's like, I don't even, okay. Integrity Hall at about 6.30 p.m., which is the best time to fire your handgun accidentally, 
Of course, well, that's, uh, is Texas, uh, is that, uh, what are they, central time? Maybe it's not the best time to fire your gun. Anyway, according to the Tarleton State University Police Department, daily crime log. That's where you have to turn to get the news that somebody accidentally fired a gun in a residence hall. Oh, it's in the crime log. That's all it, that's all it gets. Tarleton, Tarleton, what do they say? Toileton. I, I don't know how they pronounce it down there. Has released a statement about this incident. Charlatan State's University's utmost concern is for the safety and security of our students, faculty, and staff. And the university takes every precaution to provide as safe an environment as possible. Yesterday at approximately 6.30 p.m., a trained license to carry holder self-reported, oh, he's so good, self-reported the accidental discharge of a firearm in Integrity Hall. There were no injuries and the property damage was minimal. Oh, it's all good. Oh, property damage was minimal. That's the important thing. The university is following its policies in responding to this incident, whatever they may be, and will continue to make every effort to assure the safety of our people. Our people. Yes. This is the first known incident at Tarleton since campus carry law has been in effect since August 1st. In accordance with the Freedom of Information Act, an open records request has been filed for more information. So stand by, I guess. We'll find out eventually. I've got to sip the coffee today. By the way, uh, switched uh, back over to the Baileys in the coffee. <laughs> I'm doing the rinse Priebus thing here. I can't take it anymore, people. Uh, I got some reassuring letters yesterday, though. I must say, I, it was a big day for fan mail, which is to say I got one. But I actually got more. Normally, I would be sipping this during uh, Greg's segment, and that's the uh, that's the big trouble. With uh, not having Greg here, so I don't get to finish my breakfast. That's what's really wrong with this. <clears throat> also, he has news and he tells you things. But anyway, uh, lots to unpack about that one, and I could probably spend all day on it. And I'm not kidding, and you know that. But uh, once again, you know, I, I don't know what else they're going to do, but total minimization of the incident. Oh, property damage was minimal, so at least we have that. But again, this was one of those things that the advocates said, oh my God, you're so ridiculous, it's never going to happen. The only people, first of all, let's be serious about what this text of the law is. It doesn't mean every student can carry a gun. you got to be over 21, and that's only basically you know, less than a quarter of the student body at any given time. And you got to be fully trained and have a, a concealed carry permit and take the state mandated training and they're all going to be they're all responsible gun owners etc etc sure enough the fully trained licensed over 21 knows what he's doing guy is the one who accidentally discharges in the residence hall where i'm not even certain that they're actually allowed in the residence hall but i don't know where else you're going to keep them but uh a couple states say they allow campus carry, but you're supposed to store it in like in a locked vehicle somewhere. I don't know. It's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. But the the Texas is the, uh, system is the one I think most. You know, they put the most work into designing it to be safe. Now, mind you, uh, when I say safe, I mean well as safe as it can be. I guess given that there's lots of guns floating around. But remember that they had this extensive debate. The faculty did about how to implement these things on state university campuses and they had to debate over whether or not, okay, are you allowed to bring loaded weapons with you into the classroom? And the professor said, I really prefer that that not be permitted. Well, how are people going to defend themselves from sudden, uh, suddenly arising mass shootings? Well, tell you what, we'll uh, put gun lockers in the hallways and students can lock their guns up before class in the locker right outside and retrieve them afterwards, which was supposed to be a compromise. But, of course, the the gun folks had both a ridiculous argument against it and a actual logical argument against it, um, although they thought both were logical arguments. One was... I don't have time to get to the locker and unlock my gun and get it out there and still defend myself against a mass shooter if he comes into my classroom guns blazing. And you might think that was the logical one, possibly, but it, it really isn't. But, I, well, yeah, it makes a certain amount of sense, except it's like, well, you know, if someone gets the drop on you, they get the drop on you, whether you're armed or not, the end. But uh, the better argument 
in my opinion anyway, was that the, f- when it comes to gun fail, accidental discharges, that the bulk of them tend to happen during transitions. That is to say, when people are arming or disarm, in the, in the act of arming or disarming themselves, either loading their weapon and putting it in their holster for a day out with the old gun, or removing it before entering, say, a gun-free zone, which, as we know, is basically the same thing as just shooting yourself in the face because you're going to be massacred in a gun-free zone, the end. But it's true when people take out their guns and uh, clear them and to lock them up, they do tend to have a lot of accidental shootings, and so they thought, all right, it's probably best if we say, you know what, we'll probably have fewer accidents and fewer people will be endangered if we just say, if you've got a gun on you, bring it in. And it goes in with you. And then, so the professors couldn't believe it. And then the professors were like, well, can we at least have a rule about carrying pistols with a round chambered, semi-automatic handguns, with a round chambered and the hammer cocked back, as many models of guns, actually, uh, the, the carriers prefer to carry that way. Uh, in particular, the, the Model 1911 uh, uh, handguns that uh, actually designed, uh, the, the, the owners love to claim that they're designed to be carried that way, and in a way they are, and the, the hammer will lock back and... Uh, it, you know, it needs a certain amount of pressure to pull that trigger, and if it's properly holstered, if it's properly holstered and nobody messes with it, everything is pretty much okay, and you can even drop, they claim, drop a uh, a cocked 1911 and not have it go off. They love to talk about this. Um, but uh, certainly uh, lots of other models of guns that people don't carry with hammer cocked they do carry with a round chambered again because if an attack begins i can't you know i can't be spending the one second racking around i I guess uh you know i don't really think that's going to be a huge issue but they say it is and also of course they then pointed out again if you carry with your pistol in this condition with a round chambered and you enter into a classroom where the rule is no chambered rounds allowed, which is by itself a normal and, and, and I think reasonable request to ask of people, people will have to transition. In other words, if they prefer to carry either outside of your classroom or off campus or whatever they, wherever it is that they can go to escape your tyranny, telling them how they can and can't carry their guns, and they prefer to carry with a round chambered, and then they enter your classroom or on your campus, and because they're law-abiding citizens, or whatever, uh, they want to comply with your gun rules, and they really don't. But they, let's say they decide to, for reasons. Um, and uh, uh, so they now have to transition from round chambered to a safer condition to comply with your rules, and that means a transition, and that means clearing around out, and that means dropping the magazine out and racking the slide and ejecting the round that was chambered and then making sure everything's clear and keeping the magazine out. Or, well, I, I guess while you're doing the racking, but then I guess you can put the magazine back in, just don't rack it again, and you'll have a gun with you know a loaded magazine in it but nothing in the chamber which will require at least two actions to get the thing ready to fire again which means you're dead because isis killed you but in order to render your gun safe under those conditions you're going to have to manipulate it and the manipulation is going to include an operation that if you do it wrong could actually result in an accidental discharge but don't worry about it because the gun's pointed in a safe direction etc etc like my foot or whatever we usually read in the newspaper got to recharge on the baileys here for just a second it's that kind of morning all right that's the end of the coffee you hear the clatter of the dishes it's very authentic i'm so authentic i should run for president anyway so they had this discussion so end result is that in texas you can carry your weapon with a round chambered into the classroom. 
But don't worry, because training. Except this guy, who has the training, and, uh, but don't worry, because inanimate object. Except this guy, who fired the inanimate object. Except don't worry, because we don't want them, normally they don't have them in, a lot of places debated having them in the residence halls. So, so far we haven't gotten to the point where anybody has been shot yet. And, uh, no doubt the gun loving community would object if I were to say, well, here's our first, uh, our first campus shooting since campus carry. Except, guess what? The shooter was one, the good guy with the gun, and two, he missed everybody, even himself. There was only minimal property damage. What it was. Maybe that gun wasn't a large enough caliber. Anyway, that's uh, that's where we are with campus carry. The and the proponents will of course say and that ain't no thing because nobody got hurt and even the property damage was minimal. Um, and uh, you know, uh, if if it was really going to be the wild west out there, you would be having many more of these accidents. Well, you know, time will tell, I guess. It didn't take long. It never does. It never does take long to change those rules. And, and of course, changing the rules is itself a transition period. And guess what's going to happen as people begin to get used to the idea? Maybe the, maybe eventually the curve flattens out and we don't have accidents because people get used to campus carry. But then again, probably not because the reality is that, uh, especially with the way it's actually designed. See, now this, I shouldn't say this because they're going to use this as an, a, as leverage to lower the age, but you're going to attend a, Generally speaking, the first three years of college under the age of 21, and though you're totally awesome with guns, you're not going to be allowed to carry a concealed weapon on campus according to the rules until you're 21. Then, of course, when you turn 21, you'll say, I will carry because I'm awesome with a gun, maybe, or maybe I'll just learn to be awesome and get some training right now, but even so... Uh, even if you're already trained, you're making a transition from I never used to carry my gun on campus to now I always carry my gun on campus. And that will lead to mistakes and you will be perpetually renewing that class of student at every single campus that allows campus carry in Texas and elsewhere every year. Every year, one quarter of the campus will become newly eligible to carry their guns with them and will make these mistakes the end i might as well tell you right now luckily this time nobody got hurt and uh, i guess we're i mean we're we're certainly glad about that i'm not i say i guess i'm glad we're uh, glad about it because i know that there will be people who will actually actually gloat about this oh you people said somebody would get shot and they didn't so you're wrong hi whatever Anyway, uh, I guess that's also an opportunity for us to remind everybody that the law-abiding, uh, respect, what, what do we say? Responsible gun owner, that's the phrase, um, is another thing, uh, that deserves some examination. We always say, uh, oh, he was a responsible gun owner until he wasn't, till that moment when something went wrong, something unexpected went wrong. But I must say that there's actually quite a bit more that goes wrong that we don't discuss all that often. And I hinted at it when I said, uh, oh, you know, somebody may enter onto the campus or into a classroom that has a posted rule, no, uh, no chambered rounds, no carrying with a round chambered allowed, uh, on these premises. And then they'll say, well, I need to comply with that. Very often the responsible gun owners do not comply with that. And it's not usually, I, I don't think, not because they say, well, you know, I, I would love to comply with this because that's the kind of guy I am. I, I love to comply with the demands of others. That's why I carry this weapon all the time, so I can constantly comply in safety. I don't know. But very often gun owners, uh, at least on the more anonymous online gun forums, love to make a show of how, or at least a claim of how they ignore the rules set for them by losers and and wimps and betas and cucks like the rest, the normies who say, uh, on my property, I prefer that you not carry or not carry in this condition. And uh, there are many people who just simply believe, well, that's a violation of my Second Amendment rights, just as they're frequently uh, claiming that uh, when somebody says, well, I think you're actually wrong about that. That, That's a violation of my First Amendment rights. You can't say I'm wrong. 
that's not actually how the First Amendment works, and that is not how the Second Amendment works. Uh, you can't simply say uh, that, uh, you know, uh, my right to carry is unabridged everywhere by everything, by anything, including your private property rights. That's not actually the way it works, but they they claim that it is, and there's nobody there to have a legal argument with them about it until they have their accident. And then they find out, oh, that's not actually how it works. I just got charged. That's weird. But they very frequently, I will see on anonymous uh, gun forums, uh, advise one another that you're perfectly within your rights to ignore the signs. Now, I've heard, they'll sometimes protest, I've heard that if the sign is posted correctly, then I have to comply. But the, most people, act, you know, the, the regulations in many states surrounding the signage, the sign has to be actual a certain measurement and the letters have to be of a certain size and has to say some certain magic words designated by the statute. And if the punctuation is wrong or the sign isn't posted high enough or the lettering isn't big enough or anything like that, then it's invalid and I can carry my gun and there's nothing anybody can do about it. But isn't that the case if they do it right that I have to disarm? Well, no, LOL, no. Uh, you don't even have to do it then because the Second Amendment guarantees your right to protect yourself wherever you guys are. And they advise one another, just ignore it. Besides which, criminals don't follow those rules, as you know. And so uh, you would be foolish to disarm yourself knowing that the only people who will be armed in here are people who are armed in contravention of the posted rules, which means, by definition, they have malicious intent, and you don't want to be in there unarmed with people with mal- who are armed with malicious intent, do you? So you should take your benevolent intent and your gun with you in there, and it's okay to do that because you don't have malicious intent, except for the malicious intent, I would remind you, of ignoring the posted uh, restrictions. But that's okay because you're a good guy with a gun. They really do believe that this is operative and then of course they have it you know we find out about it generally speaking when they have an accidental discharge and shoot themselves or someone else or just endanger people in general and then afterward they say hey, i brought my gun to the movie theater where the the prohibition was posted because what am i going to do if some maniac ignores that posted rule and start shooting in the theater but but you ignored the rule and started shooting in the theater ah but i started shooting by accident you know, oh, I'll, I'll just, this bullet will just come out of my back now. Oh, sorry, you're in here by accident. You need to go. Well, my mistake, pardon me. I'll, I'll be hopping out of your, uh, scapula now. Sorry for the intrusion. Scapula, I think that's right. Anyway, uh, you medical people can tell me about whether I got, it's in the back, right? Like sort of the back of the shoulder blade. Uh, somebody in our rugby team back in college broke their scapula because you lower your shoulder too far to make a tackle. Don't lower it far enough and you'll break your collarbone. Lower it too much and you break your scapula. That's how I remember it. Okay. Anyway, uh, so don't uh, hang out at Tarleton State University, I guess, would be my first piece of advice. Texas would be another place I probably would uh, urge you to avoid generally except that there are so many nice Texans out there. Anyway, uh, other issue of the day, uh, Donald Trump. Trump issued this thing. We don't know what it is. And he's having a press conference this morning. I believe I've I've not read this thoroughly because I don't care what he's really doing. Uh, I care about the optics, as you know. And so Trump is, I guess he's doing his press conference, another one at his uh, in-construction D.C. hotel, I guess the one in the old post office building. And uh, I do see some people in the press sort of questioning, what's our obligation to go to something like this? He's he's defending, a uh, you know, a, a statement that's chock full of lies and we all know it. And we all have to go to one of his properties and promote his property and everything, except it's all too late for that. Um they're going to go. I see that they're there. David Farenthold is there. Here we have this, all this respect for David Farenthold, and he's at the press conference. But he, like many members of the press, probably there, like, oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to nail him. And and it's, I'm sure they're intent. Then there's no sign posted that says you shouldn't try. But 
you know, everybody's going to go there and they're going to be the ones to nail him. And I guess Farenthold has a shot because he's nailed them before. But I don't know whether he's nailed them face to face or not. Anyway, so they're all going to go and uh, cover his thing and, and he'll blather and someone will shout a question and he won't answer that the way you want. Uh, there's more detail, I guess, out now about uh, the way Ivanka has been shutting down interviews that she doesn't like, both at Cosmo and elsewhere. And Junior is doing the same thing now. And uh, so here he is having another press conference and everybody's going to go and everybody's going to cover it and there's nothing we can do to stop it. And if you were wondering about that, you know, about uh, whether or not that would happen or how many times has it happened, I mean, I guess you can't blame the press too much for covering the first couple of these things that turned out not to be anything like what he said they were going to be. Uh, either I'm going to release my medical records or I'm going to release, uh, I'm going to give away the veterans money that I gathered or Melania is going to have a press conference about her immigration status or anything like that. I'm going to give a major foreign policy address. And instead he just goes and uh, says, uh, you know, whatever the hell it is he wants to do and jokes on you. Just as, uh, I mean, why do you know that there's Trump ice brand water? Why do you know that there's such a thing as Trump steaks? Poss- it's possible you bought some back in the day before you knew exactly how horrible Trump was. And maybe you only did it for the lulls. But most people know that there are Trump steaks and found out that there was Trump ice water because... Trump said, I'm having a major press conference to address something totally serious. And the press showed up at one of his properties again, which he, you know, bills his campaign for and pockets that cash. And instead of giving a substantive answer to anything, shows the steaks and the water and passes some out. And I have wine and vodka, all of which is no longer even true. But he just pretends, I mean, that even that conference was a, a, a lie from top to bottom. So... Anyway, people are out there judiciously studying his statement and what it means. And truth be told, uh, that uh, among those judiciously studying these things are, uh, well, our own friends at the Daily Coast and around the progressive blogosphere. But we got to get the facts out there one way or another, I guess, and, uh, and, and make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, so I'll take a look. Here's uh, Barb, uh, Barbara Morrill uh, just uh, updating us. Barb and MD, those of you who uh, are longtime readers will remember. I just thought I'd throw that one out there. Uh, so she's, uh, I, don't, I, she, I know she doesn't buy it. There's not a chance in hell she believed this at all. But <clears throat> her obligation is to get us all up to speed on this thing. So... She uh, has to opt for the clunky headline just to get it right here. Trump campaign, not Donald Trump, issue statement saying Trump is not a birther. They lie. It's tough to, to spit all that out and fit it in, but that's the only way you can get this headline right. As late as Wednesday night, Donald Trump, the person who did more to promote the lie that Barack Obama was not born in the United States once again refused to retract his racist-driven conspiracy theory. And suddenly, late on Thursday night, the Trump's senior communications advisor, Jason Miller, who may or may not be a real person, issued a statement claiming that Trump has given up his birther ways. You may recall the last couple of uh, weeks, perhaps, his line has been when people ask him about the birth certificate or whatever. He says, I don't talk about that anymore. I don't talk about that. And they said, well, but you always used to. And I mean, are you, is this now a new policy that, that you're not doing? That? I don't talk about that anymore. I just told you I don't talk about that. You're asking me again, and I question what kind of uh, report. Do you have integrity? Do you have intelligence? I said, I don't talk about that. So it also becomes an, an attack as well. All right. So now Jason Miller, who's totally not Donald Trump, says, like the John Miller, I thought that was hilarious. I would have avoided, for optics sake, hiring a spokesperson named Miller, but there are so many people named Miller. It's just coincidence. Anyway, like naming his son Barron. In 2011, Mr. Trump was finally able to bring this ugly incident to its conclusion by successfully compelling President Obama to release his birth certificate. This is the claim in here. 
and everybody has pointed out the whole thing from top to bottom. There's a you can slice it a million different ways and get a million different lies out of this. He didn't bring anything to a conclusion. He didn't compel the president to do anything. Blah blah blah. Mr. Trump did a great service, no, to the president and the country, no, by bringing closure, no, to the issue that Hillary Clinton and her team first raised, no. You know all about that. Inarguably, no. Donald J. Trump is a closer. No. Having successful... Can you... What a dick. Having successfully obtained... No. President Obama's birth certificate. No. When others could not. No. Mr. Trump believes... No. That President Obama was born in the United States. That part is true. He was born in the United States. That you believe it? No. First of all... He, as has been repeatedly debunked, Hillary Clinton's campaign did not start this racist-driven smear, period. It's a lie. Call it one. Second, Trump brought this ugly incident to its conclusion in 2011. B.S. She says the word. She's got that freedom. I I hate her for her that freedom. (laughs) A month after Obama had released this birth certificate, his birth certificate. Oh, yeah, I sound like him. His birth certificate, the actual one. Trump was chatting it up with Jerome Corsi and said it was a forgery. In 2012, he tweeted that an extremely credible source told him it was a fraud. He called on Republicans to go on the offensive on it. He congratulated Sheriff Joe Arpaio for proving the birth certificate, which he puts in scare quotes, is a fake, along with complaints about the media's silence on the subject. In 2013, he called it a computer-generated forgery, And he inferred that the man who verified the birth certificate died under suspicious circumstances. In 2014, Trump promoted tweets about it being fabricated, called on hackers to check Obama's place of birth. And in an interview, Trump, quote, kept veering off on long, excited tangents. This is in the Washington Post. Long, excited tangents about forged birth certificates and presidential cover-ups. I have a whole theory on it, and I'm pretty sure it was right. Yeah, Trump brought the ugly incident to a close in 2011. Sure. So, what prompted the press release? That is a, that's the question, I guess. Did his campaign realize how it looked for Trump to go to a black church in Flint, Michigan to joke about its poisoned water and then run to Fox News the next morning and insult and lie about the church's pastor? One piece of the puzzle I forgot to remind you of yesterday was that he also insisted that when the pastor interrupted him, that the crowd started chanting, let him speak, let him speak, let him speak. Except, duh, the whole thing was on videotape. That didn't happen, and the videotape proves it. You're such a moron. Oh, well, he doesn't care. The day's over, right? He's still alive, still running for president. People could still vote for him and elect him. He's still got access to money, even though none of it is really his. Okay, so the sun's shining on Donald Trump. Why should I change? Okay. So let's see, where were we? So did, what did he prompt, what prompted the press release? Was it because he went to Flint and had this uh, run in? Was it Hillary Clinton calling out Trump on Thursday about his most recent refusal to disavow his racist birther movement? Asking, when will he stop this ugliness, this bigotry? Who knows? But there is one thing to remember here, and it starts with a Donald J. Trump tweet. Don't believe the biased and phony media quoting people who work for my campaign. The only quote that matters is a quote from me. He is quoted as saying, because he said it himself on Twitter on May 28th of this year. So, officially, Donald Trump has renounced nothing, not his racist birther stance, or for that matter, the many, many lies from his campaign's press release. We'll have to see how many media outfits cheerfully report that quote Donald Trump said... While, you know, that he, uh, blah, 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 uh, rejects birtherism, while cool, uh, while cooing about his tremendous outreach to communities of color. Stay tuned. And I guess we should be tuning in at some point. I don't know when the, when the, uh, press conference begins on this thing, but I did see that Farenthold is there. And since I like to monitor what Farenthold is doing from moment to moment, we might as well take a look. Uh, he tweeted a picture of him, of, of his arrival, uh, from his perspective. It's not a picture, it's not a selfie of him at the place, but, uh, when was that? That was 15 minutes ago. A picture, uh, of the press conference hall 
and uh, just with the notation that he made it. And uh, let's see, has he tweeted anything since? He'll be, I'll, I'll say he'll be my go-to guy on on this one just to see uh, live in real time what's happening over here. Let's see. The, uh, oh, he's still talking about all the uh, foundation stuff. Oh, Armando. You know what? Let's let's uh, let's lean on Armando here for a second. Good morning, Armando. Uh, I hope you're happy that Donald Trump has renounced birtherism. Have you, are you not? Oh, oh, or have I been pocket dialed? This would be fantastic. <laughs> Maybe, or else he can't hear me. That's a possibility. So he hung up. How would I rate the quality of that call overall? Hmm. It wasn't that problems were so bad that the call was impossible. But okay, well let's see. He's trying to connect again. Armando. Are you hey, there? Dave. hey, there you go. Okay, I was getting worried that you you pocket dialed me. No, I didn't. I dialed on purpose, but I couldn't hear. I don't know what was going on okay, there. Maybe so I had a bad connection. Like an accidental discharge of some sort. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't say anything untoward. Mm. Right. Well, I might, let's I might, get to I might it. have to have a, a, a speech at a hotel in Washington to explain how Hillary Clinton said it first. Yes. Uh, so Donald Trump, as it happens, is running for president. And then something happened today. Yeah, well, I, it's happening supposedly in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. As you know, you probably discussed it already. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Uh, he, he gave an interview last night to Robert Cost on the plane and ah. basically he did not deny being a birtherism. In fact, that he said he'll answer, answer when he wants to. <laughs> oh, uh, right. It's that sort was of like the, when he'll release the his tax right returns. Thing. I'll answer when the timing is right. I saw uh, yeah, a series of tweets that I haven't shared yet from Joshua Warren just making a joke about this. I'll, I'll do it when uh, at the right time. I guess that's it. At the right time. He's keeping the suspense up, he said this morning, to Maria okay. Baratono, who is a very friendly reporter to Trump. So he wouldn't even tell her. Uh, but what is he going to say? I think he basically tipped off that he's going to read the campaign statement that was made last night. And, yeah. Uh, that'll be his statement on it. Okay. And, well, of course, you probably analyzed cool. that statement already. Uh, well, but. to an extent, uh, yeah. Mostly I, I said, uh, let's not analyze this. I'll, I read Barb's piece so that there was some analysis, but the, the fact is that um, analyzing it, I think, falls into the old reality-based community thing about, well, you'll, we'll make a statement or we'll take a position and you'll study it judiciously, as you will, during which time we'll take a different position. And uh, so it's hardly even worth analyzing. He's a he's a lying sack of anything you want to put in there off the air. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and the campaign issues this thing because, you know, little Jedi mind trick. If it works, great. And if not, the alt-right gets lulls at laughing at the normies who took it seriously. Yeah, I mean, there's that. I do think there's something... If you scratch a little bit besides the fact that everything in that statement is a lie, literally everything besides is a lie. That. There's not one true statement in that. Yeah. I think including – I would include that Trump really believes Obama was born here. I, I Let me shock people. I think he doesn't believe that. I think he, he really does still believe Obama was not born in the United States. Yeah, maybe. But be that as it may, one of the things that I thought was interesting about the story, and I think he'll say it again – He's going to say Hillary Clinton started it. It was this terrible, as he said in his statement, terrible, dirty, you know, typical Clintonian nastiness. Yeah. And then all he did was finish the job. So he finished the dirty job of Clintonian dirty tricks. Thank you for picking. Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess so. And I, then he said, yeah, you know, he did the Obama a favor by clearing it up. Thank you so much. So I, I, I do think one of the great questions, if I was able to interview him, would be, do you think President Obama should thank you for what you did on birtherism? That would be a great question. The the, would be yes. I think it's the greatest question. Why? He's going to say yes. Yeah, absolutely. I cleared it up for him. Uh, I, I, I established his legitimacy in a way, by the way, that 70 million of you did not. Or whatever the number Except, of voters was. Well, you know, and of course this goes to the lies in the statement. But the, the statement says once the birth certificate was released, he mm. said that was it. It was done. 
and uh, the issue was cleared up. Except, you, you know, you've now seen all the tweets. For the last five years, as recently as January of this year, in an interview with Wolf Blitzer, yeah, he was still saying that he doesn't believe Obama was born in America, in the United States. It could have been a so, body double. Huh? I say it could have been a body double. So I just <laughs> it could have I been a body double. Make exactly. sure that everybody body, knows a, bo- a double baby. Yes. One. <laughs> uh, I just I you know I feel compelled to point that out as uh, all responsible. Uh, you know, commentators should. I'll tell you why. Maybe I, I I think this issue is more resonant than maybe a lot of other people do. I, I've actually, as you know, been, I think everybody's in on it. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's easy to understand, and it is blatantly racist. It's not explainable uh, by deplorables. There's no way that even the reporters can spin this as acceptable, and they haven't. To their credit, you know, Philip Bump at the Washington Post wrote, yeah. you know, it's basically a definitive piece, just saying everything he just said is a lie. And yeah. a lot of people are saying it. I, honestly, some of some people get a little weird uh, in their focus. Like Chris Cuomo was like, he was fine, but he was like, well, why doesn't Trump say it? Well, you know, I get mm-hmm. what you're saying, Chris, but let's start with this fact. Everything that was said in that statement, it was a lie. Every, you know, they all start with, no, Hillary did not start. And I'd give them credit for that. And look, it's compared to how they've been, they've been pretty good so far yeah. on this. Yes. We'll see what happens after he makes a statement. I think that's quite, you know, will, will he, say. will he, will they say, well, that resolves that issue and forget about it. Which yeah. is impossible because he spent, you know, five years being the king birther. He's the Republican nominee because he was the king birther. This is. Yes. The disconnect uh, in certain ways. I mean, uh, it's this isn't some tick or some little problem that he had that he's just now cleaning up. It's why he won. Yeah. You uh, know, and Glenn Rush says, you know, Debs are having a hard time accepting that there's racism in America or something to that effect in a tweet. I swear to God, he wrote that in a tweet. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. You guys have just been calling the basket of deplorables a gap <laughs> yeah. for a week. And you're saying it's Democrats who have the problem accepting that? I was like, <laughs> dude, stop. Just stop. That's insane. And in fact, the funniest thing is he backed off it like in three tweets later. Well, I think race is a part of it, but there's other things. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, dude. So you're the guy having a hard time accepting that there is uh, – uh, a strong pocket of racism in the United States and in Donald Trump's support. That's you. It's not Democrat. It's, yeah. So it, it was just, it's just crazy. But look, I think in many ways, here's a chance for the media to redeem itself for its, I think, historically yes. inept and unacceptable coverage. I, I do feel that way. I've never seen it I'll in a agree. campaign. I don't know if it'll uh, happen, but. but but uh, I, I agree. This is a great opening, and 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 the fact that there are already, and I mean a lot. It's it's not everyone, but there really, I would say, the majority of reporters uh, who have been covering them for any amount of time uh, are, and who are attending this thing or who are going to report on this thing are going with the idea in mind already. Yeah, this is crap, and I know it, and I now I'm I, I should, I was always attending. With my eyes rolling secretly, but now I can do it openly because, come on, nobody's going to call me out as being biased for pointing out that which we have all read and many of the same people who would ordinarily question me have been celebrating uh, for reporting that that happened again. There will People will do it anyway. There will be alt-right attack folks who say, I know very well that everybody is going to laugh in my face for saying this, but the point, I'm going to do it, and, and somehow, you know, in their secret clubs, they say, but really, I'll be laughing in your face because I will already have predicted to my friends that you'll laugh in my face, and then when you laugh in my face, I'll say, ha, see, I can control these guys like dancing monkeys. But <laughs> what? Okay. <laughs> okay. Fine. Yeah, I mean, that the is, king that of your is a, an incredible dude. phenomenon, at least on Twitter with these mm-hmm. reporters all... <sighs> You know, they just uh, – here's the thing that I always think they could say. Look, we're figuring it out. Trump is unlike anything we've ever covered before. 
the normal rules don't apply, and we've had some trouble getting it right, but we're working on it. Yeah. Why not say that? I don't know. I, I, mean, I, am I, not sure. I don't think that's actually an adequate explanation, but at least it comes closer to recognizing there's a problem. Yeah. The Washington Post yesterday, by the way, uh, managed to find a way. They, they finally broke the barrier and put the, the big L word, the lie word, in a political headline yesterday. So I'm mm-hmm. hopeful, except that the, the lie word showed up in a headline talking about Harry Reid. <laughs> <laughs> we caught him. Harry Reid lied. He is a liar, and he lied. And uh, thanks to Yeah, Chris I remember Litzman, that. It was about Mitt Romney's tax returns. That yeah. Lied, right? It was a except- lie. And I guess I guess it was. You know, I, I, listen. You want to be? You, know, you want to parse it? What he said is somebody told him oh. he, that oh. Romney okay. didn't pay. Any I mean, you taxes. could parse it. I guess why not? What the hell? We'll parse it. But yeah, okay. So it was a it was a lie. It's true. It was, and that's it wasn't true. What he reported said because Romney did pay like seven percent effective rate or something like that. I guess. I, so, but even so, I think uh, the the story was that Harry Reid was saying, you know what? I found out that it, I knew ahead of time, really, that it wasn't exactly true, but I did it anyway, and I'm glad I did it. It was the best thing I ever did, which was <laughs> kind of hilarious, but only the sort of thing you could find hilarious if you're on the same side. You would find well, it infuriating if you weren't. But uh, And so it is. Here's, it's a lie. Here's how, how I would explain they, it. It's never not like the Republicans ever, ever cared about the truth. Well, that's true. I mean, and Reid said, if you guys are going to pretend – that the truth doesn't matter, why should I respect the truth as well? And I say this, actually, about transparency. Mm-hmm. What, the last few weeks or even more, all this discussion of Trump being more transparent than, than, than Clinton was, I, 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 you know, I'm saying that you, you've destroyed transparency. Because if Trump's the measure of transparency, you'll never see tax returns again. You'll never see medical records you, you'll get what he's giving you. Why should a candidate for office say that I'm going to do these things? Because you're going to just, yeah. oh, well, you didn't give us our tax returns. So why yeah. should you do it? There's nothing but trouble in your tax returns. There's no good story coming out of your tax returns, right? Mm, no. Well, no. <laughs> so there's no, there's no positive reason. The reason you do it is to avoid the negative of getting slammed for not releasing it. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, it's, and I've known for quite a while that this was going to be the, the upshot of this, because, I mean, frankly, the upshot of the, the Mitt Romney campaign was that you didn't have to release your taxes. Eventually he did, et cetera, but I mean, it dragged on for so long. They only did two years, so. Yeah. It it dragged on for so long that it was pretty clear that, yeah, yes, somebody could push this further. That there, there will just be a candidate who just says, forget it. What I'm are you going to do? I mean, unless the penalty is yeah, you're off the ballot, uh, then uh, they're just going to say, eh, maybe I won't do it. Yeah, I mean, I I see your point, but at least as a norm, as a custom, yeah. if you if, mm-hmm. look, the, the media, how much did you hear about the stupid press conferences? How much did I what? Did we hear about Clinton not doing press Oh, yes, right. They right, had a day. clock. Sure. <laughs> That's true. I forgot about the clock already. And yes. they never have done that with the tax returns. No. And let's, no end to that clock. You know, I, I don't think press conferences matter at all. Uh, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. It's it's just spectacle and nonsense. I mean, yeah. there's nothing special about it. You know, ten people get to ask one question. Whoa, that's great. And five of them are going to be stupid because they always are. True. Three are going to be eh, and two might be good questions. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, uh, some of the idea, some of the craziness was, well, the, the format, I mean, look, the format can't possibly matter. It's the questions that matter. It's the right? questions. It's the information. I mean, yeah. And then when your questions are so crappy, I don't even know what to tell you. I mean, it's, the, the, who, who is the, probably for, gun, for, for actual reporting going out there that, that's actually gotten the most credit? And, and, and I think that's great. I think it's about time. For actual, Dar- David Farenthold, yes. how many interviews has he done with Donald Trump? That is, uh, well, I'm, I'm thinking zero. Although Zero. Yeah, interviews, yes. And uh, I guess this might even be his first press conference in attendance with Donald Trump there. He's, he went today. 
which is kind of funny because I hear I'm saying I, it's, this is the point where reporters should stop showing up, and then the one reporter that we think has been doing a great job is showing up. But okay. yeah, well, the, unfortunately for him, the press conference got canceled. I, Did it? I don't know if he knows it. Yeah, it's just <laughs> going to be a campaign event. Oh, okay. Well. What? What's the difference? It's not open to the public. I don't. Uh, he's not. I, 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 he, I guess he might take questions, but it's not a presser. This is really something. I mean, uh, it's because I, I guess they have to show up just to be able to report what got canceled because it's so absurd that it's a story in itself. But I really, I don't even know anymore. Why should you do anything for this guy? Somebody who did one of the members of the press, New York Times reporter, today saying, "What's the press's obligation here?" He calls a, I mean, without even addressing his pattern, just this one piece. He's calling a press conference to discuss something we all know is ridiculously untrue, and he's doing it at one of his properties, and he's going to just spend the time talking about how what a wonderful hotel this is. Why do we have to go to this? But but it's full. Well, I, I don't mind them going to it. I tell you, yeah. the the thing that that has changed in his. Uh, you know, just bad journalism. You show a snippet of a campaign event, five minutes at the most, seven minutes. But, you know, he gets an hour speech on uh, free every night. Now, yes. I don't think I think much of his speeches aren't helpful to him. Right. I, I'm not someone who who would uh, who argues the other side. But you, 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 I'm more concerned boy, about basically not taking on the fact that he doesn't know anything, he's a racist, he lies about everything. I, you've got to be able to say that. If you cannot, and I saw an NPR say, well, if we say he's lying, half the country will tune us out. Well, if they tune you out, they tune you out. What is your job yeah, as a journalist? Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's not... You just You just got finished telling me how terrible I am for saying it's half the country. And that it's not. So, so one. Right. Well, that's number one. Let's, so only a quarter of the country will tune you out. Second of all, my guess is that if they need to tune you out, then they've heard you along the way say that some of these things aren't true and they'll probably stay tuned to find out what the story. If they tune you out for saying what's true, my guess is that they're not losses to you. They were already gone. They will all just be continuing to not tune you in because they hated you from the start. You know, I mean, the old argument about journalism is I'm not a fact checker. You know, I'm just mm -hmm. reporting mm -hmm. on what each side says. You know, the, the old classic, uh, uh, some argue the earth is flat, others disagree yes. uh, thing. I mean, there are things that are true and things that are not. And if it's your job as a reporter isn't to say what's true and what's not, then I'm not sure what you are. Why don't we just have a camera? Show, just let them read their statements on camera. Let the other side read their statements on camera. We'll be mm -hmm. a jury. And off we go. And uh, America can dial in. Exactly. Hmm. Uh, yeah. if that, that, that argument never made any sense to me. Uh, the ridiculous, I mean, shameful column by the new New York Times public editor wow. uh, which I'm sure you discussed this week uh, is just incredible I mean it's it's an embarrassment to her even though she should she's not embarrassed and that's embarrassing she should be <laughs> embarrassed about it because it's one of the most ridiculous columns she says well we got to be weary of being cowed by uh, accusations of false equivalence. How about being worried about getting it right, telling yeah. the truth? I don't know, and I don't know why that can't be your aim. And and, and really, uh, you know how to not be worried about being cowed by uh, accusations of false equivalence? Don't be. You know, okay. You say these things. I'm I'm not listening to you because I don't believe that it's true. And okay, so go on with your. <laughs> Go, go on about your business, I guess. But I don't know. It, uh, it's, well, there, there's no correcting for it. And uh, this is a, a long time, long term problem with both, well, I guess every aspect of the press. There's just no way to deal with it in, as a business. And I guess that's probably, that's part of the, 
the problem is that it, it's, you got your business model here. But um, I don't know. I mean, even well, maybe that would help you ordinarily clarify your thinking. The idea that well, we have to be balanced because we would miss out on this portion of the market. Uh, haven't we refined our market metrics, you know, our marketing metrics to the, at this point to be able to answer the question of whether you're really losing anybody here? I mean, you guys well, they, know what kind of losing. car we drive. Certainly, and, print, print is losing. Uh, the yeah. New York Times is losing huge, and it's, the New York Times has made a bad business decision because much of its readership, I would say, probably sixty to sixty-five percent, is Democratic, and. The New York Times has been the worst media organization in this election, not because they are necessarily the worst reporters per se. You know, they're, you know, Fox is obviously the worst, but we know what Fox is. Mm -hmm. But the New York Times had an imprimatur of the paper of record. Yeah. But no one thinks of it that way. I, well, some people might, but most people don't anymore. I mean, the new editor, well, he's not new anymore, but the, the editor, Dean Baquette, has destroyed the reputation of the New York Times in three years, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, no, and an no one reads the New York Times the same way. And there's a reason for, for, for it. And, uh, this, this election is truly uh, an amalgam of just terrible factors that play to everything that's wrong with the media. Clint, there is, in my view, tremendous bias against the, the Clintons in all media. And then you have Donald Trump on the other side, who they simply don't know how to cover. Yeah. And you put it all together, and this is truly the worst performance by the media in the history of politics. In, I mean, in my lifetime. Maybe in the 1880s they were the worst. But yes. uh, <laughs> since, the, since the illusion of a neutral uh, press. I guess that's it, true. It, it's... Good bet, anyway. It, it's, it's unbelievable. And, you know, it, and... It's those two factors have uh, really just brought out the worst in them, and in particular the New York Times, which is truly a, not good anymore. It's it is bad. Yeah, I've, I, I've traced both the problem and my increasing lack of interest in much of what they do back to torture question we can't find a way to deal I, with I, it i totally see see what you're saying <clears throat> yeah. on that and it was absolutely outrageous um they used the euphemism enhanced interrogation that was adopted by the bush administration and that's tilting the story yeah that was the because first because as right objectively excuse. objectively what happened what is defined under international and u.s law is torture yeah. Well, like uh, enhanced interrogation is torture, alt-right is uh, white supremacist Nazi. Right. And, you know, they said, well, we, that would tilt the story. No, that would be telling the truth. If the truth tilts the story, there's a reason for it. Yeah. Pretty much. And you think about it, you know, if they, if, if they were covering the exact same acts, if it was Egypt or Syria or Iraq, they would have had no problem calling it torture. Uh, right. I mean, that would be part of the agenda. Of course, because they also would... that's objective, because yeah. those non-Americans can engage in torture, but not us, because then that might mean yes. we're tilting the story. Well, if Fox News had been Iraq, then Roger Ailes' office would have been a rape room. So, you know, you got your agenda all over the place. So, you know, it, it, it's it's incredible. But the birtherism story, which I think will dominate the news for the next few days at the least, and if the Clinton uh, campaign plays it right for longer than that, um, the, uh, the reality is uh, it's easy to understand. It is not even, I guess... Some reporters can pretend, well, we don't want to call it racist because, mm. but it's it's well ingrained, I believe, in the American public of all stripes. I mean, that birtherism means racism. And he basically had it, was the king of a racist movement for five years. Yeah. Uh, so no, no, if, no if, it, if really. and I think that that shorthand of whether he's a birther or not is basically... To me, acceptable 
to just accept, to, 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 to explain it that way because I think there's a general understanding that the birther movement was racist. Yes. Although, yeah, I like for most of its existence, they would, they would duck that if you ask them about that. You would say, no, it comes from my concern about our constitutional system of government. It's, it's in the Constitution for a reason. It's really not. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, <laughs> I remember one. hearing that from Orly Tates and, yeah. and, and everybody. But, you know, uh, it, it wasn't really acceptable then. And I don't I think most news outlets didn't really buy that. And I, you know, to be to their credit, they didn't accept that. Uh, but it goes beyond 2011 now. See, this is the thing that's interesting about the press statement. And this is why the story should have legs. Trump says he settled it in 2011. It's now 2016. For the last five years, he has never said he accepts that Obama was born in the United States. He's going to say it theoretically today, or he might even be saying it as we speak, five years later. Mm -hmm. And number two part of that is he kept saying that Obama wasn't born in in the United States, up to and including this year. So that's just... You know, a provable falsehood, and you can basically go through all his Fox and Friends appearances and get him saying it probably every week. I didn't watch him, but, you know, he would go on there once a week, right? And I'm sure he talked about birtherism every week. Yeah. The other thing that, that I would say, there's just so many angles. Joe Arpaio. Joe Arpaio, remember he sent his, his uh, elite team to Hawaii and all that stuff yeah, and did right. an investigation? I do. Okay. Well, he's he's a chief surrogate for Donald Trump. What does he think? Is he does he accept that President Obama's a uh, born in the United States? Because after his big investigation, he said he didn't. He's, he said he proved he wasn't born in the United States. Mm-hmm. So all I'm saying, I'm giving you different angles to this story that means it should have legs. Uh, we'll see. I mean, I know Fox News will say, well, that settles it there's nothing more to say and they won't utter the word birtherism again but we're not talking about fox news nobody expects they're just not a news organization you know uh, by the way chris wallace should not be the moderator of any debate he doesn't work for a real news organization and he's already made statements that are just disqualifying uh which show an absolute bias uh in favor of Donald yeah. Trump, which isn't surprising. He works for Fox. And his chief patron is coaching one of the debaters. Exactly. <laughs> okay. If nothing else. Right. He's got conflicts of interest that disqualify him. Uh, so I, I don't know how that works, but you know, I, he's going to be the moderator. And, he, and the people say, well, now he'll do a good job. No, he won't. So he's going he's gonna to do a terrible job. Uh, mm-hmm. At the end of the day, we know this. Uh, but we are where we are. Uh, but you listen, let's see what happens today on the coverage. I, I'm, I'm 99% sure he's basically going to regurgitate the campaign statement from last night in his own Trumpian style. And it's all lies. And we'll see if the media accepts it. I, I, I think they won't, at least for a day or two. They may drop it after a few days, but at least for the next few days they should really... Uh, should be interesting. Well, I should say so. So we'll see when this. Uh, be- I don't know whether he's late to this thing or or what, but I, I think they just. Uh, I just saw somebody uh, tweeting a screenshot, by which I mean taking a picture of their television with their phone. Of, uh, <laughs> that they're doing their full the the exact same mistake they've made with everything. That over and over again, he calls events saying they're going to be xyz and then they're not that but they cover it end to end breathlessly cnn doing the same thing here's footage of his plane landing he's he's on his way here he comes it's the pope of you know the pope of morons i guess is uh has landed and he's uh he's making his way to the press conference which has already been announced he's not really going to be what they said it was going to be but we're all here anyway in the trump hotel for a Trump campaign event uh, at which he said, I don't know who the, who, nobody knows what he's going to talk about, but they're all sitting there in a Trump building for which he's paying himself again and which no one will mention. 
Uh, and uh, there we go. Uh, there'll be footage of a guy in a suit saying some things, looking like a candidate for all the you know. Just turn off the audio. That's probably the best. That's the request they should make. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, the Trump campaign will just say, just turn off the audio on everything we do from here on in. Yeah. And if you don't, you're biased. Yeah. It, uh, you know, I, it, it, it's just an amazing situation, yeah. as in the words of Chris Saluza. Uh, amazing, though, in a bad way. Yes. Um, and here we are, All waiting right. to see if a major presidential candidate will renounce his racism. It's 2016. That's what we're doing today. Okay. So good way to spend our day. <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Anyway, thanks, thanks, thanks for letting me unload a little. Certainly. Uh, and uh, I, I think we'll have a lot to talk about next week. I think so. So we should do more shows. We should do. You shouldn't cancel the show today. All right. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll not Keep it, it going another week at least. Okay. All right. That's a good idea. Okay. Thanks. Have a good weekend, yeah, Armando. You know, no charge on that uh, business idea I just came up. With. No, it's, then it's not a business idea. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. All Bye-bye. right. We'll uh, clear the decks then. Thanks again. We have, uh, of course, we're still expecting to hear from, and, and I don't know whether, you know, uh, waiting patiently for Armando to be done. Maybe still wrapped up in business. Maybe wrapped up in business for the rest of the show. But the the premise here is that we'll hear from Josie. Uh, you know, sometime in the 10 o'clock hour. I, and I told her right off the bat, because she had this other business to take care of, don't worry about it. We're doing it casual. You call when you're ready. Sit down. Relax. Get a glass of water. Whatever it takes to make yourself ready. No nerves should be involved here. And by the way, even if that evolves into, my God, the, the calls, they ran away from me. I have business to take care of. That's cool. We'll do it again. It doesn't have to be Friday. It can be any time. No pressure. There's a million things we could talk about, but if you're, you know, but if you're still ready, absolutely, we'll take it any time, uh, and and we'll we'll just shift gears a little bit. It's always wise, I find, to end a Friday with something else. I don't always get to it, but uh, this will force the issue. This will be a a good thing. Uh, in the meantime, I will tell you. Uh, that there's one other piece of gun fail news, and I think we can keep this one relatively short. But the New York Times has an opinion piece here, and we know how much we value the New York Times' opinion. But this one is, I think, unassailable uh, from this end anyway. Uh, I'm certain it's being assailed elsewhere, but the piece is entitled Missouri, the Shoot Me State. I just thought we should add this one to the Texas story. This was probably going to be the lead gun story if I had gone that way. Uh, absent the, uh, the discovery of the Texas story just before airtime. This is an editorial board production here. And an alarming victory for the gun lobby, as they all are. Missouri's Republican-controlled legislature voted Wednesday to override Governor Jay Nixon's veto and enact a wholesale retreat from gun safety in the state. And I can tell you from writing the gun fail columns, Missouri is in no position to be retreating from gun safety on any front. The law will let citizens carry concealed weapons in public without a state gun permit, without a criminal background check, or, and I guess I should say, without firearms training. You remember, once again, all of the excuses that we kept hearing from, well, only the trained people. It's gun training that will help you avoid accidents, and you got to know what you're doing. And training, training, training. And that's what NRA is all about: training. And we encourage everybody to get training. Uh, when it com- when push comes to shove, they don't want the training to be mandatory, because uh, there are, there are radical elements, even within the radical element of the NRA, who say a training requirement is an infringement on the Second Amendment rights. Period. If people are no good with their guns, that's their problem. They'll probably end up hurting themselves and no one else, except, of course. As has been well documented, they hurt plenty of people. And even when they only hurt themselves, then we all have to pick up the bills at the emergency room, despite the fact that they all have GoFundMe campaigns to try to pick up medical expenses that way. It rarely comes to fruition, and it doesn't even matter. And in the first instance, we're paying for the emergency room care anyway. And who knows what else? Disability and blah, blah, blah. Okay, you get the point. So this new law would have done at least a little something to help out. But the, the upshot of the override of the governor's veto is no 
permit necessary, no background check necessary, no training necessary. It strips local law enforcement of its current authority to deny firearms to those guilty of domestic violence or other high-risk individuals, and it establishes a dangerous stand-your-ground standard that will allow gun owners to shoot and claim self-defense based on their own feelings, essentially, their own sense of feeling threatened. That's one of the larger problems with stand-your-ground, but there are many more. The measure has drawn no great national attention, but it certainly provides further evidence that gun safety cannot be left to state lawmakers beholden to the gun lobby. Democrats opposed to the Missouri bill called it a perfect storm of lowered standards for the use of deadly force and an invitation for people to be armed without responsible controls. The measure was enacted by the Republicans, despite strong opposition and warnings about the threat to public safety, from the State Police Chiefs Association, those bunch of commies. Every Town for Gun Safety, one of the groups fighting the gun lobby, noted that stand-your-ground laws result in disproportionate harm to communities of color. Mr. Nixon, no relation, a Democrat, vetoed the measure in June, saying it would allow individuals with a criminal record to legally carry a concealed firearm even though they had been or would have been denied a permit under the old law's background check. Mayors Sly James of Kansas City and Francis Slay, that's an unfortunate name, of St. Louis, warned against restricting the power of the local police to deny guns to those who commit domestic violence. They cited sharp spikes in domestic violence homicides in their cities, and they noted that the police would be left at greater risk by this bill. Blue lives matter, except when it comes to my guns, which matter more. Blue steel matters, I guess. Republican legislative leaders who cut short debate on the override vote on the last day of the session, were ebullient in overriding a variety of the governor's vetoes beyond the gun measure, including one that will force voters to show a government photo ID. Ta-da! Senator Maria Chappelle Nadal, a lawmaker from Ferguson, which erupted in protest, you may have heard of it, after the 2014 fatal police shooting of Michael Brown, an unarmed African-American teenager, in case you forgot who he was, warned that enacting the Stand Your Ground standard would mean another bad Samaritan like Zimmerman. She was, of course, referring to the shooting death in Florida four years ago of Trayvon Martin, another unarmed black teenager by George Zimmerman, who used a Stand Your Ground defense allowed under Florida law and a gun. Missouri is joining 10 other states that loosened gun laws to allow concealed firearms in public without the need for a permit. Federal gun controls still require background checks on buyers, but only at federally licensed dealers. Unfortunately, there is a separate and busy uncontrolled market where buyers at gun shows and on the Internet do not have to undergo background checks. In the presidential campaign, Hillary Clinton has called for extensive gun safety measures, including a ban on the assault weapons favored by mass shooters, closing background check loopholes, ending the gun industry's outrageous protection from civil damage suits, and denying guns to risky suspects on the government's no-fly lists. Lots of problems ensue, but okay. Anyway, Donald Trump, though, uh, endorsed by the NRA, favors more armed civilians ready to engage in what he calls a defensive shootout, because he doesn't care what he says. This is one of the most pathetic measures yet of his pandering when he should be leading on an issue of vital importance to the public. La-di-da. Well, upshot for me, no pun intended, of the Missouri uh measure is uh, hearkening back once again to one of our old stories and I'll dig it up for you so you have a link when Scott helps me put together the summary but uh, I remember it I'm taking it from memory it was probably about uh, two years ago that we found out that at least one and I think it was suspected many more uh firearms trainers certified firearms trainers in the St. Louis County area in other words the guys uh who it was required uh, to get their certification that you had completed an X number of hours of training, classroom training and live fire training in order to get your gun permit for a concealed, to get your concealed carry permit, right? That and the, the training was minimal, like eight hours is all you had to do. And they were just forging it. You paid them a hundred bucks and they would forge it for you. And uh, as it turns out, people were forging their documents to get their concealed carry permits in Missouri anyway. And they knew this and they arrested the people who were doing this. And so the legislative response, I'll just leave it here. I think the legislative response now on the record in Missouri is what we'll do about this is 
will repeal that training requirement. And then all of the guys who are NRI, NRA certified gun safety instructors who have been forging these documents will be able to walk after all and, uh, and, and, and walk safely because they'll, of course they'll be armed. So I thought, I thought that was a rather remarkable response to the, the problem that they unearthed of uh, forging all these documents. Well, just get rid of the requirement for the documents because, uh, Really, what do you need to know? Point and shoot, like a camera, right? Get yourself a gun. Okay. So I think I'll close the books on that particular chapter of the gun issue and transition. Instead, uh, Josie Duffy, ready to join us here. And uh, uh, hi, good morning. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Uh, uh, I am. am. I'm also I'm great. Also How about that? <laughs> I got a little bit of an echo on your You're line there. Are you... Uh, uh, have you got your laptop open? Is that what you're, are you using a headphone or a headset? I was using my laptop open. Would it be helpful for me to get a headset? Yeah. I okay. Think, hold on just now, one second. I'll grab one. Okay. Well, okay. we'll do that. I, although now I think that the echo is a little bit gone. Maybe turning the volume down would do the trick. Well, we're informal here, like we said. Okay. I have headphones right here, oh, so great. let's test it out. All right. We'll give it a shot and make sure your microphone is still working when you've got the headphones in. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, all right. Let me uh, let, let, try again here. What about now? Okay. That sounds pretty good. Great. All right. We'll go with this. So, uh, hi. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, I know it's been a long time coming, and uh, I, I was telling everybody that I thought that this would make a great uh, addition to Friday, though certainly we could do this any day, but uh, on Fridays I tend to try anyway to, to spend at least the last part of the show giving people something to talk about over the weekends that isn't already a siren blaring headline like whatever Donald Trump is doing at the moment. Right, right. <laughs> uh, so this gives us a chance to to get in depth on something that uh, we all, I think, instantly recognize as important and then say, I, I feel bad that we haven't given this enough attention, which is why we have you giving it all this attention <laughs> on the front page for us. Uh, uh, but welcome. I know I've been introducing uh, you all along, and I don't think even need much introduction to a Daily Coast radio listening audience. But uh, you, you've been covering – how would you describe the – because I was sort of struggling to do it off the cuff. But, I mean, it's more than a justice thing, and it was it was both at the same time originally more focused, but also, of course, you go well beyond that. How do you describe what you do for us? Yeah. So, um, the, the simple answer I think is that I'm, um, I think I have the greatest job ever, which is that I get to, uh, write about prosecutors, um, um, prosecutorial elections, prosecutorial misconduct, um, for daily coasts. Um, that, like you said, that also expands. Sometimes I write about other criminal justice issues. I try to write about judges a lot. I write about prisons and police sometimes, but, um, most of my work is around prosecutors. Um, and I kind of, uh, got into this, I got interested in this about uh, seven years ago or so when I was, um, working, uh, at the local public defender's office here in New York, um, Mm. and began to realize really just how powerful prosecutors were. And I had had really no idea, um, the power they, they had. I think, um, it's becoming more of an issue now because outlets like, Daily Coast have, you know, directed time and resources to the, to the question, um, and to the, to the role that prosecutors play. But, um, I think still now, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of informing people left to do. You know, yeah. we, we don't know as much as maybe we, we would hope to or should. I can imagine that that's the case. I, 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 I'm, I'm glad, I'm very glad that this was a specific part of your charge at Daily Coast, mostly because uh, at your traditional media outlet, I mean, even ones that do a great job or that, that approach the criminal justice system, and there are fewer and fewer of them, I guess, that approach it with a healthy skepticism about what prosecutors in particular are doing, uh, the I think the average uh, maybe legacy leftover approach to the prosecutor's side of the criminal justice system is there's, there's their public servants, they're putting the bad mm-hmm. guys away. Yeah, uh, you know, stand and salute the flag kind of stuff that, uh, well, you know, traditionally might might have been merited in some cases. Uh, we've learned enough that to know, I think, as 
mature adults that that can't always be the case. And surprise, it, it really isn't. Right. But your traditional media still has the issues of, you know, what's our standing in the community here? We can't be the ones saying the judges and prosecutors are always should be subject to this kind of scrutiny. When a story arises, we'll cover it. But right. stories only arise if you do what you do. Yeah, well, you know, and it's and it's um uh I spend a lot of time trying to um it's hard to find stories on the local level sometimes, especially about jobs that people don't really keep up with and there are 2400 DAs um in uh the country. I obviously can't track all of them. Um and I should say now that I also have a uh Email address is called prosecutortips at gmail dot com. Oh. Um, if anybody ever has um, information or questions or wants to to write in, because that's really how I find stories, right? I have to hope that local news catches them. I have to check up on what's happening in the courts. I have to try to keep track of um, these DAs. But it's it is like you said, it's really tough because people are interested when an issue arises, but you don't really know that an issue arises unless um, someone's interested enough to to find it. And that's usually local, local people. Yeah. And uh, even when they did arise, I guess traditionally the, the courtroom reporter or, or the local crime beat reporter, uh, it's, it, it's a low position on the totem pole yeah. in a lot of uh, newspapers. And, and, and it's kind of like, cause it's a hit or miss thing. You, you spend 90% of your time doing traffic violations. Right. Uh, but then every once in a while, something crops up. But uh, there's no really good way of comprehensively covering the system without a lot of time spent on things that don't rise to right. the, to that level. So uh, what? Uh, well, let's see. Let's, let's talk a little bit about what's happening for you currently. Uh, okay. And, and certainly, if you have anything, if everyone loves a sneak preview. So we'll talk first about what's, <laughs> what's been published lately. But if you have any. Uh, I guess juicy tips on what's coming up next. That's always appreciated. What's, but what's your latest publication or the, or at least let's say, uh, we don't even have to limit it to that. Certainly the, the, the hottest thing that's got you excited in the last week or so that you've been writing on. So, you know, it's election season, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are, it, I, I just wanted to say you highlighted something really important, I think, which is that, um, ooh, uh, most of the people who would be doing the local work on this don't either have a background in criminal justice. I'm a lawyer. I went yes. to, I, um, went to law school. So some of this, I, I have a little bit more understanding or it, it's, I can see immediately off the bat why it's such a problem, but I think that's tough a lot of times for local journalists. Um, and you know, they want to keep good relationships with law enforcement, of course, because that's who gives them stories and that's right. who gives yes. them comments. And so that also creates some like complicated incentives. Um, True. that have led to sort of this, um, have led to my work. Um, cause it turns out that I don't need the local prosecutor in Oklahoma to like me too much. So <laughs> I'm lucky true. in that way. Um, but, um, so we have some big elections coming up, um, in November, um, and a lot of elections that just passed. So I'll tell you a little bit about what has, um, been exciting in the past couple of weeks and what has, um, been, uh, worrisome. Okay. There are some people that I have been following in Florida, primarily um, Jeff Ashton, uh, who was the prosecutor in Orlando for the past uh, four years. Um, Angela Corey, who you may remember, prosecuted the Trayvon Martin case um, and did not convict George Zimmerman. Um, and then has just really been kind of a terror uh, since that time. Um both lost their primary elections in Florida on August 30th, which was very exciting. Yes, we um, got that story. I read that one on the air. Yeah, so we're kind of seeing this new um, era of accountability. We're not all the way there yet in any way, shape, or form, right? But we are seeing some of these prosecutors who have done pretty terrible things um, be held accountable by voters, and that's really, really exciting. Um, we also, you know, there were some elections that we lost that I... Um, would have liked to uh, uh-huh. win. One of those is in Broward County, Florida, um, and that was um, also on August 30th. Uh, the prosecutor there has been there since 1976. Um, 
the racial disparity in Broward County is, is outrageous. The lack of transparency in Broward County is outrageous. And that's one of those places where, um, we'll get them next time. But, <laughs> you know, that's one of those places where I'm disappointed that we didn't get a win. Yeah, um, and what's coming up, you know, I think, um, we have already had two of the three of the biggest four cities in America or counties. Um, that's Cook County. Um, that's Los Angeles County. That's Harris County in Texas. Um, had elections this year. We mm-hmm. defeated Anita Alvarez, um, uh, in March. Um, you know, she, she had been pretty, um, terrible in Chicago and Kim Fox won that election. <coughs> uh-huh. Um, and Jackie Lacey in Los Angeles ran unopposed. Um, and so she's going to win, but there's another big election coming up in Harris County in Houston in Texas. Um, Devin Anderson, who is there, um, has been, um, really kind of the worst type of prosecutor. She has focused on low level crimes to the detriment of, um, bigger investigations. She has, uh, been a crony candidate. She's, you know, protected people in her office, Mm -hmm. really protected, um, um, people acting. Um, she, she's, she's, she's not good on accountability when it comes to police and prosecutors in her office, um, prosecutors in her office and police in the city. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's also, um, she, has a problem in her office of wrongful convictions. She um, was recently in the news for jailing a rape victim um, so that really? uh, she would make sure that the, she showed up to court. Um, the woman promised to come back to court. She was mentally ill. She had been uh, suffered sexual assault, but Devin Anderson kind of jailed her just to be, just to be sure. Uh, um, wow. And, you know, people like her are everywhere. Um the role of district attorney is still a very, uh, a role that really lacks accountability. The incentives are really bad. They have a lot of power. Um, and that kind of combination, right, of power um, and no accountability and bad incentives is a really, really problematic combination. Um, so as we kind of go into this election season and then 2017 and then the really big year will be 2018, we have to think about um, how we can ensure that not only do we get good people in these roles, um, but we also are able to hold them accountable. Yeah. And anyway, what a challenge it is, too. I mean, uh, the other huge hurdle, I suppose, is that uh, in most of these places, anywhere you go, really, uh, you, you're starting with a substantial portion of the electorate who confronted with problems like this essentially shrug it off and say, well, you know, it's the criminal element, so who cares? Right. And, you know, very often, even when that's true, of course, well, we have this whole constitution and everyone loves it. And we're supposed to have these procedures. But, I mean, we've been 30, 40 years now saying yeah, all, all of these rights that this constitution, so-called constitution, guarantees people is all just coddling criminals anyway. And why don't we just get right to the point? So, yeah, you, you, it's it's a difficult uh, argument to have and a difficult segment of the population to raise a lot of, and even people who are not particularly, uh, uh, receptive to that kind of argument or that kind of thinking still say, uh, g- generally, run of the mill, the people who are involved, who find themselves caught up in the criminal justice system, uh, not people I encounter every day, right. not right. a person I'm concerned about, or the system okay. will work and they'll be set free eventually. Right. Well, I, I, I think you um, obviously highlight a really important um, obstacle that people um, in the criminal justice reform field uh, face, which is how do we make sure that everybody cares about this, even if everybody doesn't feel directly affected? And, you know, I want, I, I'm, you can come at this from a lot of different perspectives, right? You can come at criminal justice reform from a lot of different, um, perspectives and, um, value systems. But to me, one of the things I always think about, um, and it's not what it, it's not what drives me to do this work, but it is certainly what, um, it certainly, uh, helps me remind me of why it's important is that it's, it's only not you until it's you, you know, mm, yeah. um, the, you, you, 
you you never know when you're going to get caught up in something when you're going to get pulled over when you you know when um you jaywalk and who knows you know what what the local cop decides to do or what happens to your kids or your kids friends or you know there I'm constantly hearing from people sort of saying I never thought I'd be here ah. now it's not to say that like um I think you, I think everybody should care about this even if they never have to encounter this system, right? But when we think about an accountable, um, democracy, we want to know what our elected officials are doing and we want to make sure that what they're doing aligns with, um, what we care about, um, and what we value. And right now that's not happening. And there's really no middle ground. You don't get to say, well, you know what? I never really thought about the system, so I don't want to be in it. If, if it turns out that you, um, find yourself having to deal with the criminal justice system. Um, this sounds more ominous than I intend it to, but <laughs> you're going to wish that you had, you know, paid more attention to these elections. And that is really, really true. And it's, and it, um, it's affecting a lot of people. We still, even in this quote unquote era of reform, there are still, I think now we have 28% of the world's prison population, mm. I think is what my most recent statistics say. Um, you know, we're, we are, uh, and that's, that's prison. That doesn't count the people on probation, parole, paying fees and fines who are stuck in, um, you know, right. who can't pay bail. Um, there are a lot of ways that this, um, that the system gets its tentacles around, uh, good people, innocent people, people on the right, um, not on the right, in the right. Um, and, um, okay. yeah, people <laughs> on the right very rarely. Right, right, exactly. Um, and you know, they deserve some more attention. So I'm glad that, um, I can, uh, join you and we can talk about this, um, not just today, but over, you know, in yeah, the well, future. Yeah, this will be going on forever, regardless. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, the, uh, and that's a, it is amazing. And it's a familiar point too. I mean, really, I guess pick your issue. How many times have we felt like we've heard that you, you, you'll wish you had, paid more attention or if you find yourself in this position whether it's dealing with your insurance company over health care coverage or the, the the line you used about you know it's never you never think it's going to be you until it is i happens in my gun stories all the time right um but yeah the uh the the power of the criminal justice system is well the, the system's enormous the power that we give it is enormous and a lot of that came from uh, assumptions that we made back in the day when it was mm -hmm. either easier to keep an eye on things or uh, there was, I don't know, less going on behind the scenes, perhaps. But mm -hmm. I, I imagine intrigue was always a part of of the way these things operated. But um, yeah, the uh, my, and I, my own one of my old law professors used to say there's an old saying there were people uh, that uh, conservatives loved and they would say, well, you know, a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged. You know, <laughs> somebody who finally faces the, you know, a, a, a right. victim of a crime and then, then they become much more conservative and, and tough on crime sort of thing. But, uh, another professor remind me that a, uh, a liberal or at least a civil libertarian is a conservative who's been indicted and suddenly right. finds out, oh my God, <laughs> these guys are out of control. Right. Right. So there's something for everybody. It's not a partisan issue. No, it's not. Sense. And you know, um, I, one of the things I really try to do is, um, make it clear that there are a lot of people who have suffered, who have been victims of crime, whether violent crime or property crime. Um, and they are also starting to see this differently. They also don't think that, um, long jail sentences or, or excessive sentencing or, you know, putting a juvenile in prison until they die is, you know, is retribution, um, is, uh, is fair, is, um, really addressing the problems that we see. And so as we kind of, uh, evolve as an advocacy community, um, a lot of research is being done also to show that like, average people are seeing criminal justice somewhat differently and want kind of different solutions. So that's encouraging. Hopefully every liberal that gets mugged will now doesn't have to be, <laughs> doesn't have to be a conservative now. Well, yeah. And uh, by the way, you can be liberal and angry that you got mugged. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think exactly. that's fair. Uh, I'll give you the license to, to do that. So 
Yeah, I guess uh, one point I'll, I guess I'll, I'll also bring up is, uh, again, just to sort of go back to the, the issue of this is not an easy subject to cover anywhere, but it's particularly ticklish to do in a uh, in small town papers or even mm. gigantic papers of record where the people who do the coverage rely on the people working inside the system, police, uh, prosecutors, judges to give them tips or explanations of what's going on or even just to comply with requests for basic information so that when you uncover misconduct, you have to be very careful and very gentle about exactly how you handle it in right. coverage so that you don't lose lose access. We've That's, again, a familiar story. And Daily Coast kind of, if you if you had any question about why you would park a project like this here, besides the fact that, well, okay, this is a community of people who care about these and have reason to care about these things, uh, it's it's the kind of place where you can do this work and not have to worry about that kind of interference. And like you said, you, you uh, by the way, you pointed out, well, I, I went to law school, so I don't need anybody to necessarily explain these things uh to me, so the access question isn't as big a deal. But by the way, if you're just listening, she didn't just go to law school. She went to the law school. By the way, I know you wouldn't want to. You didn't want to come right out and say Harvard Law School in case you're keeping score at home. I'll let everybody know that. Um, but I mean, what a tremendous thing it is to be able to have this here at Daily Coast, and 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 I imagine operations just like with everything else. It's 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 not easy to keep somebody like this on staff doing this by the way and uh, i know occasionally they your bo- people get bothered in their email every once in a while to contribute to kick in a couple of bucks to make sure that all the things that we do the elections vertical the action vertical this as well daily coast radio that that these things can keep operating uh, i want to encourage you to keep this in mind too that the new york times could be doing this but they're not, not in this yeah. way. The yeah. Dallas Morning News could be doing this, but they never would. And, uh, you know, this is this is something unique and of incredible value that we are lucky enough to have here. Because uh, I think you probably found out you could have made a lot more money doing something else. When you <laughs> from Harvard Law School. Yeah, but, uh, I think that ship has, has now sailed. Um, <laughs> We're but done with that. But I actually, <laughs> I really, um, I feel so lucky to be um, at Daily Coast because it is an environment where you can um, talk about tough stuff, um, hear what uh, hear what people have to say, and um, approach tough issues and new issues with the encouragement um, of people who also care about them and um, also want to see change. So it's I'm I'm so lucky to be here, and I think that um, you know there there are not a lot of people doing this work. It's just not it's not funded. Right. Yeah. It's not a lucrative position. Um, I would have been waiting a very long time if I had gone into this, uh, graduated from law school and decided immediately to try to write about prosecutors. I would have been yes. waited until this job came around. Um, <laughs> and it's certainly not happening as much in the progressive community. There is um, more writing about it, you know, in libertarian uh, media, yes, but there isn't true. as much on our side. Um, and so, to me, it's it's just been such an excellent opportunity and one that um, I hope to continue to make good use of and hope to um, bring some awareness about this issue to uh, to people listening and people reading. Yeah, and uh, there has been a growing awareness in the progressive community. But you did mention, and I think you're you're, ex- you're exactly right. There's been a, a long time interested in the libertarian community for a number of reasons, some right. of which are more altruistic than others, mm-hmm. but. Uh, yeah, they've sort of outpaced us in that. I guess for a long time, liberals and progressives in particular, I think we had to sort of tiptoe back to this issue because it's all, it's all of a piece, you know, just to get back to where we were able to say, hey, the Patriot Act might have been a bad idea. It, 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 we're intimidated in many of these, uh, arenas to get back to, you know, there's a serious issue here underlying the, the, the flag one or the, uh, support your, support the troops and support your local cops one. Uh, and, and, and it's taken a lot of work just to get that out of the way. And I guess libertarians didn't have that issue for whatever reason. It, although mm-hmm. the issue may have been, no one's taking it seriously anyway. So what the hell? 
but uh, mainstream liberalism has been a low, a long, a long slow. That's so that's long together. I guess. <laughs> Climb back to to focusing on this, but thankfully there's been a renewed interest, and and it's widespread, and certainly uh, this. I guess this rash of at least well-reported and well-covered uh, shootings in black communities by police has helped in the weird way to, to refocus us on this, the, the private prison issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, that seemed like an easy way in, too. But you're right. It's not generally funded. I guess the most celebrated funded arm of this would be sort of the Innocence Project, but that's an an awfully small slice of the criminal justice system, an important one because of lives are at stake. Right. But, in, yeah, as you point out, in the meantime, there are people whose lives are being pretty well ruined, languishing in local jails that, A, don't even show up in the prison count because jail is different from prison. And right. And, two, uh, you know, have stand to lose everything, sometimes over jaywalking and traffic tickets. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're lucky to have you focusing on it as lucky as you feel uh, to be here whereas we're twice as lucky to have you do it so i guess i well one i'd love to make this a continuing conversation whether it's a regular Absolutely. one or a friday one or whatever day we can settle on whenever you're free so that you can focus on more on individual stories that this was a great baseline to launch with is there something that you're working on now or something that's published recently that you would highlight as uh, just an individual story yeah well i published something this morning that um has been on my mind this um past couple days which is um the portland da um his name is rod underhill has been um kind of he has been good uh good in a few ways and bad and 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 many more um and he just hired a new assistant prosecutor in his office this prosecutor um, was previously a police officer um, mm. and in 2010 was uh, fired 11 bullets into um, the body of a young black mentally ill man. Now, the man who um, was killed, Keaton Otis, um, by all accounts, um, was at, the, at that moment um, suffering a, a mental break and uh, did act violently towards, um, police. So it, my problem is not necessarily that this is, that the actual act was, um, completely un, unfounded. Yeah. Um, but more of that, we count on prosecutors to hold everybody accountable. Uh, we count on them to hold police accountable. We count on them to hold, um, some local officials accountable. We count on them to hold, ourselves accountable and our kids and to create an environment that is safe, um, and healthy. Uh, and when you have a prosecutor who, um, in a city like Portland where, um, police have been considered to be, uh, pretty racist and, um, pretty brutal. And, uh, the DOJ found that they really did not handle, um, mentally ill, uh, um, interactions with the mentally ill well at all. Um, the idea that you would hire someone who has been an active participant in another's death in that way, um, is, uh, really problematic to me. So I, I wrote something about that on the site today. Um, I have a couple of other things coming up in the next few weeks that I, um, I'm really excited about and don't want to say too much about yet, but mm, we'll okay. tell you more about next week. Yes. Um, so you have to invite me back. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, um, that one, I think, maybe highlights some of the reasons that we really have to be vigilant about um, who's serving in these roles. How can we count on a former police officer who was the subject of a grand jury investigation um, about the, the possibly... Um, problematic death of a of a 20 year old um mentally ill black man to hold other police officers accountable if this is happening again i mean it's entirely possible that they can do that but they can only we can only trust that they're doing it correctly if we're aware of their backgrounds at the minimum 
Exactly. Yeah, and, you know, we don't have a say in that. No. Uh, so, no. um, so I've been trying to get the word out on that and there's other stuff that I will definitely, um, come armed with, um, that I'm really excited about for the next few weeks. Great. Okay. Well, let's, let's, we'll talk about how we can make this a regular thing in a way that yeah. works for you. Yeah. Uh, Thank you I, so much. We try to make it easy. <laughs> So, yeah, this is great. Thanks for coming on and joining us with that Port- Portland. Uh, uh, that re- reminds me, but the Portland police chief just on my gun fail list not that long ago. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Well, okay, yeah. that had nothing to do with it. But okay, uh, they got some problems to clean up in Portland and elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. And you'll help us do it. Thanks again, uh, Josie Thank Duffy, you so much. joining us for the first time here. And we'll try to make this a more regular thing. I think you laid a great foundation for w- what kind of stories we're going to get from you and how wide ranging it can be. So I'm looking forward to getting good weekend conversation stuff for smart people from you. Thank uh, you so much. Thanks so much. I really for coming appreciate on. it. All right, great. We'll talk again. Thanks. Jesse. Absolutely. Bye. Take care. Bye. And have a great weekend. Mm-hmm. And the rest of you as well. I, I hope you'll all take, uh, take some time, review what she's posted if you haven't. And I don't know. I mean, it may be ridiculous to be telling the audience, Oh, you should be reading what she's right. Uh, we've been reading it all along. It's, we've been waiting for you to have her on the air. That's as likely as anything else. But I can't stress, and I'm struggling to find the words, but I hope I'm impressing on you how important this avenue of inquiry is and how broad it can be. And if you've engaged on bits and pieces of it along the way, whether it's private prisons or some suspect shooting or another somewhere or uh some kind of uh, crony prosecutorial deal that raises an eyebrow. Uh, I think you'll find that this vertical and geez, I mean, I don't even know whether it's even fair to single this one out versus some of the other verticals that we do. Everything has a storyline and everything has dots to be connected. And you know, we've got these overarching story arcs that, that stretch over months for us here on the radio Sometimes it's just impossible to get it all connected and put down in writing. The thing would be entirely links. And talking it through uh, off the cuff is the only way you can illustrate these enormous storylines. And so I hope this is w- just one of many visits from Josie. I hope this is just one of many people who will begin visiting us more regularly in the future to help talk through some of these enormous storylines. This stuff touches so much of our lives and it's so incredibly difficult. And especially once you realize how many storylines there are that touch so much of our lives and how interrelated they all are, your head explodes at some point, but only by talking it through constantly can you really open your eyes to the enormity of the picture. So thanks, Josie, for doing that. Speaking of the enormity of the picture, there is yet more, and that means it's time for the after show. This is where we apologize to the listeners for getting too granular about the things that I focused on and shift some uh, shift the viewpoint to some of the other stuff happening today that definitely deserves your weekend consideration. Specifically, the United States wants $14 billion from Deutsche Bank to settle the massive mortgage fraud case. The bank says no in a terse, clipped German sort of way. Jimmy Carter, mine would be the way, is horrified by white privilege and a resurgence of racism in America. I knew he would be. And as an anti-government rage brush rebel is arrested with a loaded rifle outside the Portland, Oregon courthouse, Ammon Bundy's lawyers file for a mistrial claiming prejudicial testimony by the Harney County Sheriff. Oh my God, they're concerned about the justice issues. From Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The K-Grow in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Well, thanks very much for doing so. There is more on the last half, of course. Donald Trump is upset that the jackboot food police are still around from the days of Teddy Roosevelt, and they continue to harass hardworking businessmen selling poisonous food. And Trump's maternity leave proposal is a direct attack on Ruth Bader Ginsburg's legacy. We won't stand for that, neither will you. Stay tuned.